Hello, my name is Timothy Ray Brown, and I have agreed to do a list of questions, about 30 of them, for a friend of mine, a Facebook friend of mine, who is teaching a, an English as a second language class in Lyon, France. Um, so anyway, uh, first question, um, these are questions to Timothy Ray Brown, the Berlin patient. Part one is, when you learned you were HIV positive. Question number one. When you learned that you were HIV positive, did you talk to your family and your friends, or did you keep it a secret? I, well, I told um, pretty much everyone that I worked with that I was HIV positive, like, right after I got the diagnosis. Um, I didn't tell my mother for about a year, because she was dealing with her own, with her own health problems at the time, so I waited um, to tell her. Um, I told close friends, and... Uh, um, except for my ex-roommate, because she had said at one point that um, she she didn't want to hear someday that I had become HIV, HIV positive, and she actually is upset about having said that. So anyway, um, yeah, I was pretty open about it. So question number two: How did I, how did you react when you learned that you were HIV positive? Did the pe did the look of people around you change about you change? Um, I, I reacted by, uh, basically going on with life and basically doing the things I had planned to do. I didn't stop, I had planned to start studying in Berlin, and, uh, I did that. I started, and actually never finished, but, um, but I got a good start, and, uh, it helped me learn German better. And I eventually became a translator from German to English. Translate on paper, um, not translating simultaneously, simultaneously, simultaneously. Anyway, so okay. Question number three. Oh, um, uh, oh, how, did the look of people about you change? Um, well, I I knew that um, there were other people that uh, were HIV positive, and uh, basically, I didn't want to infect anyone else, so I looked for. Um, basically looked for other pe po pe people that were positive and uh, to have sexual relations with. Um, and at that time, you could kind of tell if people were HIV positive, um, uh, well, to some extent, uh, because some of them had, had what's called Carposi sarcoma, um, and they had lesions on their body. So I looked for those, those lesions, and uh, that helped. So anyway, question number three. When you learned that you were HIV positive, oh, when when you learned that you have HIV, did you think that one day you would be cured? I the um, cure was not an option at the time. Nobody talked about it. Um, it wasn't until um, until my case uh, that people started talking about um, that, and uh, even even then, it took a while for it to become a reality that people would talk about it. So anyway. Okay, part two, living as an HIV-positive person. Uh, question number four, what was your life like when you had AIDS? I, well, I never had AIDS um, except for at one point I, uh, I took a, what was called a vacation from a HIV meds. And, uh, and so at that point it took a while, but um, my, my T cell count, CD4 cell count went down below 300, and so at that point I officially had AIDS, but um, only for a short time because I started taking my medication again, and uh, eventually became became undetectable, um, which uh, I learned later that basically if you become undetectable, um, you cannot infect other people. Um, so uh, that that meant I spent uh, a lot of years. Um, being very careful and um, only sleeping with people that um, ha had HIV, um, that I knew that they had HIV. And um, anyway, uh, so um, uh, I basically, like I said before, I basically went on with life and decided to continue studying. And I was working in a cafe um, from, uh, well, I started in the cafe and um, October of 1990, um, 
1993 and continued working there until about 2005. And uh, um, so, so like I said, I only had HEV except for that short time. Um, uh, yeah, I basically went on with life. I continued to work in the cafe that I started working at in um, October of two, or 1993 and continued working there until, um, until, uh, 2005. And, uh, and, and then I simultaneously worked as a translator, um, as a freelance translator, um, and then I got hired by the company and started working there full time. And at that point I quit working at the cafe. Um, uh, yeah, life was good. Um, I basically forgot that I had had HEV and um, went on with my life and uh, um, it was because of the medication that uh, was available to me um, particularly after after um, proteins and inhibitors came out and I was able to take those and then I took combination therapy and did very well and so I well I had been, been an activist before um, but I as a as an HEV patient I wasn't really um, an activist it wasn't until I became cured that I became an activist again for to push for a cure for other people. So, yeah. Okay, number five. Did your family and your friends support you? Um, yes, they did support me. Um, here, let me read that like this. Uh, question number five. Did your family and your friends support you? Yes, they did support me. Um, my... My after I told my mother I was positive, HIV positive, she was very supportive, um, and uh, she didn't tell the rest of the family um, because uh, my grandmother um, probably wouldn't have accepted it. Um, she probably would probably wouldn't have been very sad. Um, uh, my friends, well, I um, had other friends that were were also HIV positive and. Uh, and uh, mostly in the gay community, um, and uh, I felt very support, very a lot of support from them. Um, uh, I when I became a translator, I also told my my bosses there that I was HIV positive, and they were very accepting. Um, I didn't feel that much stigma in Germany, um, particularly in Berlin. Um, I know that other in other places in. Germany, there is a lot of stigma, um, probably similar to what you find in the United States, um, but uh, I didn't find that much in Berlin. Uh, let's see. Question number six. As an HIV positive person, did you prefer living in the U.S. or in Germany? Um, I'm going to have to close the door. Just a second. Okay. Um, Question number six again. As an HIV positive person, did you prefer living in the United States or in Germany? Actually, I never lived in the United States as an HIV positive person. <clears throat> but I felt that in Germany, um, the health care was very good. Um, it was <clears throat> basically free. I mean, my my employer did have to pay um, the dues and uh, or, um, the uh, um, the payments for the, the, the insurance. I had to pay a little, little money out of pocket, and I never had to pay anything for medication, and even when I was in the hospital um, with leukemia, I ne didn't have to pay anything. The only thing I ever had to pay for was medical work, like or, um, de dental work, like uh, crowns and, um, and bri bridges um, for my teeth, and fillings were free, everything else was free. Um, uh, so, yeah. I, I much prefer the medical system in the United States to, to Germany. Or, no, in, to Germany, no, I much prefer Germany to the United States. That was bad. I much prefer the medical system in Germany to that in, in the United States. Um, Germany, German healthcare is sim very similar to French healthcare, um, and basically, uh, well, Everybody has health insurance in Germany, like in France. Uh, so, next question. Number seven. Before your transplant, did you ever lose hope? Um, no, I'd never lost hope. I I thought that I could I could basically take uh, 
take my medication and continue to take it and basically live a pretty normal, um, happy life. Um, normal and, uh, the life expectancy for people living with HIV is very similar to that of other people who don't have it. Um, there are, um, there are added problems for, uh, health problems for people who have HIV. Um, but those are being worked on. Um, so anyway, um, <clears throat> number eight, you have had very little, you've had a very difficult past. With, hi with hindsight, which were the worst moments and the best moments? Uh, the worst moments are basically finding out that I had HIV in the first place and then um, later find out, finding out that I had, uh, had the acute myeloid leukemia. Um, that was both, both were very, very large shocks. Um, and then, uh, there was one point, uh, when I was in the hospital, um, where I couldn't sleep and I, um, basically was having, um, a, I was in a bad space and I, um, talked to a nurse and the nurse, uh, call, called in a doctor and, uh, the doctor talked me through my, um, my disgust and whatever, um, and basically, basically was able to calm me down, and I, I did very well after that. Um, then at one point I was at home, and I don't really really remember much of this because I was on morphine. Um, they were actually giving me so much morphine that I was coming very close to dying um, because of the morphine. Um, uh, basically. Um, you, they give you so much that your heart stops, and uh, I I don't know if that was on purpose, but um, it kind of seemed like it. I don't know. Anyway, um, so yeah, that was a bad point. Um, good points are uh, I was very happy when I um, found out that uh, there was no HIV um, in my blood, and then. Um, Later, that um, when all the tests had come back from the biopsies that I gave, uh, saying that I didn't have any HIV in those, um, and that uh, um, there probably isn't, or there is most likely no HIV in my body at all, um, meaning, meaning that I have something like a sterilizing cure, um, meaning that um, HIV is completely gone from my body. And I'm hoping that that's the case. So, um, uh, okay, number nine. How did you deal with them? Um, I I dealt with. Uh, well, I basically explained how I dealt with uh, finding out that, uh, or with the problems being in the hospital. Um, I I really. It was very important to me to have the support of my um, my ex partner um, Michelle. Um, he was very helpful and um, basically came into the hospital every day, um, even after he wasn't with me together anymore. Which kind of made his new partner upset, but um, that's, he dealt with it. So anyway, okay. Um, number uh, number ten. How was it for people close to you? Uh, Mitchell was, um, when I told him that I had um, had the acute myeloid leukemia, he was very upset. Um, he cried much more than I did. I don't really, I'm not a terribly emotional person, and so I didn't really cry. Um, uh, I get, um, like, deep, oh, I don't get depressed. Uh, <laughs> I just dealt with it. Um, yeah, I did okay. So, um, uh, oh, okay. Um, did I really answer that question that well? Um, uh, well, my mother, my mother came and visited me seven times in, while I was in the hospital in Berlin, and, uh, um, that was very helpful. Um, it was nice to know that she cared enough to come fly all that way to see me and be there as a support for me. And uh, um, 
so her and um, her support was very helpful, and also, yeah, like I said, the support of Michelle. Um, his support helped a lot. Michelle and his whole family. Um, I'm still actually friends with his entire family. They're they're very close to me. I'm sorry, there's I heard noise. Um, so yeah. Um, okay. Question number eleven. Oh wait, no, this is part three. The experimental transplant. Number 11. Okay, why were you living in Berlin um, at the time? I was living in Berlin. I, well, I'll start at the beginning. I, in 1990, I took a um, three-month trip with a couple of friends of mine, um, female friends of mine, to mostly Western Europe. And um, we also visited um, Greece, which was actually part of the West at that point. Um, and uh, and then I went back, and I was working in banks at the time, and I kind of back to Seattle, and I was yeah, I was working in banks, and I decided that that wasn't what I wanted to do, spend a whole life, the rest of my life doing, and I was kind of bored with it, and so I decided I was going to move to Europe, so I uh, I decided to save my money and get ready to move to Europe, and basically I kind of decided between um, between the major cities that I had visited before and um, one that I really loved liked a lot was Barcelona. So I decided it was going to move to Barcelona and work as an English teacher. So when I got there, it wasn't as easy as I thought it would, um, would be. So um, I did find work and then, um, and then I took a trip to Berlin <coughs> and uh, I was supposed to meet a couple of friends of mine, or several friends of mine, from Seattle, and uh, they were supposed to call me. And this is back in the days when those cell phones. And so I waited and waited and waited. I spent an entire month there waiting for them to call, and I never heard from them. <laughs> so I, um, I hung out there and was had a lot of fun and decided I really liked it. And uh, then I. When I had met somebody um, before, and uh, and uh, he uh, he came down and visited me in Barcelona, and then I lost my apartment in Barcelona and um, had to, um, and he asked um, Matthias asked me if I wanted to live with him in Berlin, and so I I picked up and moved to Berlin, and um, and then I. Moved back to Barcelona about a year later, and um, and then I uh, moved back to Berlin and um, and got a job there and started and and started school there, <clears throat> and decided I was going to stay for a while. And so I stayed until um, until 2010 when I decided to move to San Francisco, um, back to the United States, and. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so to make a long story short, I was in Berlin and working there, and I had uh, basically a an unlimited visa. Um, I could basically stay and work there as long as I wanted to. In fact, that is still um, that's still in effect. So um, I yeah, I happened to be living there, and uh, I was insured and uh, working, and my life was there. So that was what I was doing in Berlin. Um, yeah, okay. Next question. Um, did you appreciate being associated to the city forever by your by your Berlin patient name? Uh yes, I yes and no. Um I don't really care to be called the Berlin patient. Um I don't want to be called that forever. Um and uh um that's why I decided to to take back my name. Um that's why I decided to uh become Timothy Ray Brown rather than the Berlin patient. And uh, I became the, had become the Berlin patient because uh, um, scientists, in order to even talk about me, um, since my case had become quite well known in the medical, um, HIV medical world, um, they had to refer to me somehow, so they granted me the name the Berlin patient. I basically spent uh, 
Well, that was the one reason why I came out and um, and uh, came out out in the media as the as Timothy Ray Brown, um, and uh, showed my image to the public. And uh, um, another reason was because I didn't want to be the only one cured of HIV, and I wanted to make sure that uh, other people were involved in this um, search for a cure uh, for HIV. Um, so, I love Berlin, and I kind of like, I like being associated with it, um, and it was a large part of my life. Um, like, nearly half of my um, life had been spent in, in Europe, so, um, and a good part of that in Berlin. And, um, and uh, so I don't mind be as, being associated with Berlin. Um, okay, next question. Did you know that the transplant could be a chance to save your life? Um, at the time it was proposed to me, um, I basically, uh, I didn't think I'd need it. I was, was hoping I would not need it. Um, my, my leukemia was in remission, and, uh, and I thought that it was going to go away. Um, as it turned out, um, it came back at the end of um, 2006, uh, so... Um, it became clear that I had to get this transplant. Um, before I talked to my family, um, I even asked my grandmother, who didn't even know that I was HIV positive, uh, what she thought, and uh, um, she kind of said, well, if you, you can stay alive with the medication, um, with the HIV medication, then why risk your life? Um, originally, uh, the well, the original thought was that, um, well, in normal cases, um, the success rate is like about 50-50. Um, so I didn't feel I wanted to risk my life um, and maybe die because I, um, because I wanted to become cured of HIV. Um, I, like I had said before, um, I was taking my medication and I could ba basically live a pretty normal life um, as an HIV-positive patient. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, but then it became clear that I had to get the transplant, and then I really didn't believe that I would be cured. Um, I, I didn't really believe that I was cured until I read um, uh, the uh, paper that Gary Huger had, po or had published in the New England Journal of, Journal of Medicine, um, a very respected publication, and uh, so... I thought, okay, if they believe it, then I believe it. So, yeah. Um. Okay, question 14. Did you believe your doctor when he told you that there was a possibility of a cure t to recover? Um, that is pretty much the same as the last question. I, it, I didn't really... Like I said, I didn't really believe it until um, his article was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so, uh, I guess the answer is no. Um, okay, number 15. Have you ever met the person who donated the bone marrow? No, I have not met the person. Um, I, after two you have to, in Germany, you have to wait two years to do you, be able to ask this to meet the donor, and the donor also has to ask, uh, uh, wait two years. I never filed a request to see him, and neither did he, so um, no, we've not met. And I really would like to meet him. I have no idea if he has uh, any idea that he is, um, he, his donation of his bone marrow led to such a um, huge, um, huge thing as it has. And um, I think you should know that. Um, he's, he's a hero. He's my hero. Um, and I really, I really have a lot, a lot of very close um, feelings for him. Okay, number 16. What was your family's reaction before and after your transplant? Uh, like I said, um, I am, am very close with my mother, and I really don't, um, I'm not terribly close. Well, I don't know my father's family at all. Um, I, I, I'm very close with my grandmother, and uh, my grandmother knows that, and she's always been very supportive of me, no matter what. 
Um, so, supportive. Yeah, I'd say supportive. Um, okay, next question. <clears throat> Did you notice changes directly after the transplant? Were, what were they? After the first transplant, I, um, I recovered quickly. Um, I was out of the hospital within 13 days. Um, in Germany, they keep you in the hospital um, for the entire transplant um, and for the recovery as well. In the United States, it's different. They send you home, and uh, you have to um, deal with it yourself. Um, uh, yeah, so I got to the hospital fairly early, and, um, and uh, then I eventually went back to work, and I had been going to the gym before I started with, with well, before I was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, and I went back to the gym, and uh, um, I noticed that I was able to gain muscle weight, um, so my body started looking good, and uh, or it looked better, because um, I'd always been very thin. Um, so yeah, um, I noticed that, uh, and it was quite nice. Uh, so. Anyway, um, next question. How, how much time did it take for you to recover? Or how much time did it take to take you to recover? <clears throat> okay, number 18. How much time did it take you to recover? Um, after the first transplant, my recovery went very well. I didn't take, it didn't take long at all. I, like I said, I went back to the gym and uh, went back to work. And... Uh, but then at the end of 2007, um, my transplant was in February of 2007. Um, at the end of 2007, I was taking a trip to the United States for Christmas. And uh, um, I remember not feeling well before I left. And uh, I found out that I had the norovirus and, uh, um, and Shigella um, bacteria. Um, and uh, that was not good. Um, and then I went went to Seattle, and uh, then um, later we took we flew to Boise, Idaho, and uh, I was going to spend Christmas with with my grandmother. And um, and while I was there, I started feeling I was hearing raspy noises coming from my chest. I started feeling sick, and I well I had a cold, and uh, and I thought hmm it feels like um, like uh, pneumonia, um, a lung infection, and uh, a pretty severe one. Um, so, oh, I had had pneumonia before, um, basically walking pneumonia before, um, and uh, I kind of knew what it felt like. And uh, so I went to a doctor um, near my grandmother's house, and uh, and um, sure enough, I had the doctor came out and said, sure enough, you have pneumonia. But he also noticed that um, my blood platelet count was very low. The th thrombocyte count was very low. And, uh, and I thought, oh, it's starting again. It's happening again. Oh, crap. And uh, so I, um, I went back to Berlin, and uh, sure enough, the leukemia was back. Um, and, uh, oh, I, I have to... Um, stop there, I have to explain that I, um, I later found out that um, after three months there was no sign of HIV in my blood. So HIV was gone from my blood, um, even though I quit taking my HIV med medication um, the day of my transplant. Um, so there, there was no HIV in my blood. Um, and, uh, and so this time, um, this time the the leukemia was back, and uh, so in February 2008, I got another transplant, and that one didn't go very well. Um, I the recovery from that was long and art and tedious and um, pretty horrible, um, and actually I'm still kind of recovering from that, um, although I'm doing pretty well. Um, so yeah, part four. Becoming HIV negative again. 20. What was the first thing you did when you knew you were cured? I celebrated. I was very happy. Um, I ended up moving 
back to the United States. I was still in recovery, and uh, and I was dealing with that, and uh, I decided I wanted to do, be on my own and try to live by myself again. I didn't want to move back to Seattle for some reason. Um, I kind of had the feeling that it would, would I was would be giving up, and so I decided to move to San Francisco, and then um. And then I moved to Las Vegas, and now I'm living in in Palm Springs, California, and I'm very happy. Uh, okay, number twenty one. Do you feel do you feel a hero or just a miraculous? Um, do you feel a hero or just a miraculous accident? I I don't think I'm a hero, but um, I've been told that I am. But I I think it's just a, basically um, a kind of a miraculous accident. But um, also I think it proves that uh, scientific advances are going to lead to a, for to several cures for HIV. Okay, number twenty one. How did it feel to have an incurable disease and finally to be cured of it? It felt incredible. Um, it, uh, I well, I'd always been told that HIV was not curable, and uh, and I didn't really think that I could possibly be cured, but I was, and uh, and it felt very cool. Um, and I think that I I'm hoping that. Um, Scientific advances can um, lead to more people being cured, and I think it's going to happen. Um, there are many um, brilliant scientists working on finding a cure for HIV, and I I think that um, that they're getting closer every day, and um, there are new prospects that um, are looking positive. So um, yeah. Uh, and I'm hope, also hoping that um, this will also lead to cures for other diseases like Parkinson's, um, heart problems, cancer, whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, number twenty-three. Do you feel special or just like a normal person now? I I feel like I'm a normal person. I don't really want to be treated special as a special person, although I guess I do kind of enjoy the limelight a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just a normal person who happened to, happen to get very, very lucky. And so, um, yeah. Um, number 24. Do you live a normal life now? Yes, I do. Um, I live a normal life, and uh, I... Well, um, there are certain reasons why I can't really work um, a normal job and uh, um, I still have some balance problems. I still have problems walking completely normally um, and uh, um, but otherwise I, I feel like I'm back, back to normal. Um, yeah, I want to get to, to the point that I can basically move like a normal person and be able to do things that I used to be able to do. and. Um, like I tried ice skating, I used to ice skate wonderfully, um, and I also tried roller skating. I can't, I can't do either of them anymore. Um, I can't keep balanced, and, and I'll fall, I'll fall, fall over. So yeah, um, uh, so that hasn't completely changed to the, my, how I want it to be. Okay, part five: HIV prevention and awareness. Do you think you are a hope for HIV positive people? I hope to be. Um, I that's kind of what I want to be. Um, I think that um, although my cure um, is not something that can be translated to everyone, um, it took me having a um, life-threatening disease to having having a blood cancer to get to this way. Um, but it, it still um, has led to new research and. Uh, and basically, if it can happen to one person, it can happen uh, to many other people. So um, I think that gives people hope, and um, yeah, that's what I want to see. Okay, thank you. As the first person cured... Oh, oh wait, just a second. Um, okay, 
26, do you still fight against HIV? Um, as the first person cured of HIV, I um, would only feel comfortable if I continue to to fight for other people. I can't be the only person to be cured. I, I want, I need other people to join my club. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm still fighting for people with HIV. My partner is HIV positive, and um, actually most people that I know here in, in Palm Springs are HIV positive. Um, so, and I have uh, very deep concerns for them, and uh, and um, I want them to, them to be cured if that's what they want. Okay, um, what would you say to prevent AIDS infection? Um, well, in the United States, I would say that uh, there is um, a relatively new um, method to prevent prevent HIV infection. Um, it's called uh, PrEP pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis. Um, uh, basically, you take one pill a day, um, um, pretty much at the same time, and uh, you're you're not supposed to miss a pill. Um, although there is new research saying that. Um, uh, taking it, um, taking it like uh, um, less is also very effective. Um, but uh, yeah, I I asked Will about um, if it's uh, been approved in France, and he said no, not yet. But that they're working on it, on it. So um, yeah, I I think that that's the best method of prevention. Um, I, I think it's kind of like a, uh, vaccine, um, it, uh, it's kind of the same thing, and, uh, um, it's, it's the closest we have to that sort of thing at this point, um, so, yeah, I, I, when it is available in France, I think that anybody who is sexually active or using drugs, um, should use that, um, and that's pretty much the recommendation here in the United States. Okay, um, uh, oh, um, I guess I'm supposed to say that, um, condoms are, um, the using condoms are, uh, an effect, an effective, but not quite as effective method to prevent HIV infection. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, um, I, I still think that PrEP is better. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, um, so... Uh, what would you say, what would you like to say to HIV, oh, 28, what would you like to say to HIV positive people to help them? Um, basically that, uh, having HIV is not a death sentence, um, it, it basically means you have a, um, disease which is not yet curable, but hopefully it will be one day, um, and, but there is medication, um, so it's become a treatable disease, um, and uh, so basically the new medication will basically keep your um, your viral load. Um, if if you take it regularly, it will um, should revert, re reduce the viral load to undetectable, which means that you cannot infect anyone else, infect anyone else, and uh, um, and you can have pretty much a a uh, normal lifespan, um, and a normal life looks like anyone else. Um, so it's, it's, uh, hard to say whether the, um, side effects from having HIV and, uh, and taking medication are much any worse than for normal, normal people. Um, no, well, not normal is dumb. Uh, for people who are, who are not infected with HIV. Uh, anyway, um, okay, next question. 29. Do you think that it's important for a person with HIV to talk about it? Yes, I do. Um, I I think that talking about um, HIV, at least with some people, um, uh, with friends and um, with uh, in in groups or whatever, is a good idea. And I think keeping it keeping it um, keeping it silent, keeping quiet, is not a good idea. Well, I think that for everything. So yes, I, I would recommend talking about it. Okay, <clears throat> um, number 30. 
Do you think that we don't speak openly enough about HIV? Um, yes, that, that is very true. Um, we do not speak openly enough about HIV, and I, I think that we need to talk more about it. And, uh, and um, living here in Palm Springs, um, most people with HIV really don't talk about it much. Uh, um, basically, they kind of just want to live their lives and uh, want to forget about it. Um, and actually, I, I admit, um, when I was positive, I didn't talk about it that much. And, uh, and I kind of regret that. Uh, I basically wanted to go on, on with my life and uh, live a normal life. And that's what I did until I became sick with, uh, with um, acute myeloleukemia. That's the next question. I, um, okay, next question. 31. Is it a taboo subject? Yes, definitely it is. Um, I think that, uh, in a way, um, people don't like to talk about it. I mean, it's, uh, people think of death because um, so many people died in the 80s and um, early 90s until protease inhibitors came out onto the market. Um, people didn't look good well. Um, they were sick and and dying, and, and some a lot of them died. Um, it's, um, unfortunately, it's still um, considered a gay disease, which it's not. Um, uh, they're uh, actually in um, subtropic tropic Africa. It's uh, actually... Uh, the majority of actually um, heterosexual women who are dying, um, who, who have, have it. Um, oh shit. Okay, question 31. Is it a taboo subject? Yes, it is very much a taboo subject. Uh, in, there's a, still a great perception that it's a gay disease, which it actually isn't, because um, in some parts of the world... Um, the majority of people that are getting HIV are um, heterosexual women. Um, but there's still this perception that um, if you got it, you did something wrong, something terribly wrong, and you deserve to die. Um, and uh, um, that's really sad. Uh, and uh, in fact, there are places that uh, do not... Uh, people are afraid to go to clinics because, uh, because they're um, afraid that People know that they're they're going there, and um, the, the people will know that they or think that at least there's a perception that they um, were having homosexual sex and uh, um, or gay sex, and they and people or people are afraid of having people think that. Um, okay, next question. Question thirty-two. Will you donate your bone marrow to other people who need it? Um, I would, but I can't because, um, uh, unfortunately, people who have had um, had cancer cannot donate um, bone marrow um, or stem cells. Um, so uh, I would if I could, and I I, I also um, think that more people should do it. Um, because it's actually a very easy process. Basically, you get some medication which causes the, um, the stem cells to go out into the blood, and um, then um, a process is used to, um, to take out the stem cells from the right. Okay. okay, question 33, what would you say to prevent AIDS infection? I answered that in question 27. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to do it again. Um, okay. Uh, number 34, does your hope remain intact when you see AIDS patients dying, or sometimes do you feel so much anger that could cause, that the cause you felt was? Okay, um, once again, 34, does your hope, okay, question 33, what would you say to prevent AIDS infection was answered in question 27. Um, so I'm not going to do it again. Um, number 34, does your hope remain intact when you see AIDS patients dying, or sometimes do you feel so much anger that the cause seems hopeless? Um, I will always have hope. I am a very positive, hopeful person, and um, I, I'm sad that 
uh, that um, no one else has been cured so far. Um, but I think that uh, we need to get to a place where um, that is much easier and much more, um, much easier than what I, I went through. Um, and that uh, because there are brilliant medical scientists working on finding a cure, I think that um, one day it will happen. Um, and I'm hoping that soon. Uh, and um, I actually don't see very many people dying of AIDS that, these days. Um, the amount of people dying of AIDS has decreased drastically since 1996. Um, okay, uh, next question. Some people say we can now live with HIV as, a, as with other chronic diseases. Uh, change pages. Um, what do you think of this? Um, okay, I, I, I think that's very true. I think that, uh, that the fact that there's stigma is the only reason why it, it's treated differently. Um, I, I think that this is the same as having a chronic, uh, chronic, um, whatever, um, Okay, question 35. Some people say we can now live with HIV as with other, any other chronic disease. What do you think of this? I think that's very true. I think that only the stigma keep, keeps us from treating this uh, differently than other diseases. It's no different than um, having chronic uh, whatever, um, diabetes, chronic, um, uh, chronic pain, chronic anything. Um, uh, it can be treated and uh, and people can live live normal lives and um, it's basically um, uh, basically can be treated and uh, you know, never mind. Flood that. okay question thirty five some people say we can now live with HIV as any other chronic disease what do you think of this I think that's quite true and I think that uh, basically you, it's kind of like having um, chronic diabetes or chronic, uh, any, any kind of disease, um, as long as you're living in a place where you can get medication. Um, unfortunately, there are still too many places on earth where, where people are not getting medication. Um, and uh, beyond that, it's um, going to, if there is not a cure or cures for HIV, um, it's going to deplete our our medical systems and uh, and so I think a cure is necessary thank you